Yeah, folks, it's been a long time since I did a video, and uh, I'm kind of out of practice. And uh, don't know where to start, really. Um, I've, I've had ideas um, for my videos on how, what to do. Started on several occasions and never finished. So if you're so inclined, the video that I never made, that I wanted to make, that I may still do, is um, one on Youssef Latif, uh, the horn player. Um, I got into uh, specifically a period of his music in the 80s. Um, he went and recorded a series of a bunch of um, albums, I think about five albums for Atlantic Records. And that's pretty much what I exclusively listened to for several weeks. And was going to do a video on him on those particular albums and never got around to it. Um, but I did create a playlist, so if you're if you're curious to hear what I was listening to, and what I may still do a video on, actually all five of those albums, those Youssef Latif albums, are um, up on YouTube in full and complete. So a lot of them are just individual tunes, one at a time. So I created. A, a folder here on my channel of all five of those albums, all the tracks, and you could go in and listen to them if you're so inclined and so interested in um, what Youssef Latif was doing in the, the, the late 80s to the early 90s. And it's something I still may do a video on because the, it's very interesting work. And so I had this long, intense period where I was listening to, and I actually bought two Youssef Latif albums that I didn't have from that time period specifically. Um, I was going to do the video and didn't get to it. And then um, I was actually going through some old things I had recorded off of television years ago. Um, BET, Black Entertainment Television, used to have a channel that's not around anymore. And it was called uh, BET uh, Jazz. And it was um, primarily a station... Um, they had infomercials at night sometimes, um, but they had a lot of jazz programming, a lot of jazz programming. Uh, you know, most of it was um, live performances taped in a television studio or in a small club. And what, what an excellent source of stuff. I'm sorry that I didn't record more of the stuff that was on that channel for the several years that I had it, never knowing that it would go away. They had all kinds of stuff. They had stuff from um, from Los Angeles underground clubs. Um, they had um, shows that they produced themselves, uh, you know, with hosts, hour-long shows, and, you know, like in a club atmosphere. Really good stuff. And then they also had things that I've never seen anywhere else, uh, like performances that I don't know who recorded them. I don't think they were recorded specifically for the television station, but they're not performances that I ever saw uh, available on DVD or anywhere else. Um, and one of those uh, just goes to show how it seeing something can kind of change your listening habits. Um, so I had recorded this a number of years ago. And it was Joseph Jarman, the saxophone player, one of the founding members of the Art Ensemble of Chicago. And it was him and a solo band that he put together. Uh, for a lot of years, he, he intended on dropping out of the music industry, apparently. Uh, and he actually left the Art Ensemble of Chicago um, because he uh, was one of the guys that opened or is responsible uh, for running a Buddhist center in New York City, somewhere in New York. And he got busy with that and I guess didn't want to do the, the traveling and, and was really um, putting all of his efforts into, into this Buddhist center, which I think he's still running or a big part of in New York. And um, when he got the urge to play again, um, he, he basically went to the guys that are, you know, members of this Buddhist center, and he formed this very interesting band. Um, and it was, I think it was fairly fluid. It wasn't necessarily a um, set personnel. It was a number of different players coming in and out. But they were all people associated with this Buddhist center. And, you know, so there were some horn players and drummers and, and, and bassists. Um, very interesting uh, maybe a bit more uh, laid back than most of the art ensemble of Chicago music. Um, 
uh, really, really nice stuff. And um, watching this video again, which I want to say was probably from, I want to say the early, early to mid 90s, maybe. Um, but seeing this video, I really began to appreciate how much I like Joseph Jarman's saxophone playing. Um, and I've actually been, up, up until my Youssef Latif period, which just predated this by, you know, a month or so, I was kind of a little burnt out on, on, on hearing saxophone. I, I get that at times. Um, when, when the, the, the saxophone is just such an overpowering instrument, um, and usually when there's a, a small band with sax in it, it's the sax that's wailing over the top of everything. And I, I tend to get burnt out and, and tend to stay away from listening to a lot of music with saxophone in it, uh, you know, with the exception of somebody like Charlie Mariano, who's my favorite sax player that I love. Um, with that exception, a lot of times, you know, when I'm doing generic listening, and I'm in that period where I don't want to hear saxophone, um, I kind of stay away from bands that have sax in them. And I was kind of in that period... And so I started pulling out listening to Youssef Latif, and then I saw this Joseph Jarman video, and it really made me appreciate his playing in a way that I had never before, because there are two saxophone players in the Art Ensemble of Chicago, which is pretty much, with one exception, the only place that I'd ever heard Jarman play. So I never knew what Roscoe Mitchell, the other saxophone player, was doing, or what Joseph Jarman was playing. Um... But seeing him on, on television on this special, and there was no other sax player in the band, I really began to appreciate his playing. So, it drove me to um, pull out whatever I have with him on it. And, um, first things, the only first solo thing I have by him, this is an interesting session, this is, to date, they're still, still alive, so there's a possibility they may get together again. Joseph Jarman and Anthony Braxton, the only time that they've played together. Uh, a solo, a, a duo disc with just these two musicians, no other backing musicians. Um, this is from, uh, recorded one day, December 29th, 1971. Normally I would stay away from things recorded um, in that time period by free jazz saxophone players because they're so poorly recorded. Um, but this has a couple things that really made me jump for it. Um, one of them is, is you know, I had this thing with, you know, for better or worse, you know, a lot of the art ensemble of Chicago works I would full put into that uh, free jazz category. Um, and in the early 70s and late 60s when the music was really, I say popular, but, but you know, it was... Um, really at its at its peak. Um, you know, most of these were live recordings, and they're very poor quality live recordings. Um, and it was partially the, the technology of the time, not being able to really capture what was going on. Um, the problem with free jazz is it kind of gets noisy, and then it gets real quiet. And when it's noisy, the muddy sound of those early recordings doesn't do any justice. You know, the horns kind of blend, and, the, and usually there's an upright bass, and it's very boomy and in the background, and the drums and, and all that. And it's very hard to hear the separation of what the instruments are actually doing. And when it comes to free jazz, that's kind of important, because it's it's not like, um, you know, oh, here's the rhythm section, and the rhythm is down on the bottom, and, you know, the, there's melodies on top. Uh, with free jazz, everybody's going nuts and soloing at the same time in a lot of places. And the poor quality recordings of these, you know, and, and there's also a, a ton of dynamics. So, you know, one minute the horns will be squeaking and squalling and the drums will be going crazy. And these poor recordings, you know, from the late 60s, early 70s, don't really capture what was going on for me. Um, and um, so it makes it a little hard to listen to. On the other hand, then at the same time, recording session, you'll have, all of a sudden the piece will go down and get really quiet, and you can't hear anything, you know, because of the way they were recorded. Um, and unfortunately, by the time that recording technique started really picking up quite a bit in the 70s, you know, a lot of the free jazz was gone, but not the art ensemble of Chicago. Um, so this is the only solo thing. This is really interesting. Um, it, it, there's a little bit, less than a third of the album is the kind of, like I said, this is from December 1971, um, free jazz freaking out 
things are on here a little bit. There's kind of like um, an angry poem that's kind of yelled over some squeaking saxophone player, you know, some saxophone parts uh, at times, which, to be honest, sounds a little cliche now. Um, you know, if you were going to make a, a comedy film about free jazz, you would, you know, there's one track on here that, you know, with the, with the angry sounding poetic yelling, um, kind of might fit the bill there, but it's like a two minute track. Um, the other stuff is, um, a lot more sedate than you would expect something from this time period to be, and especially from Anthony Braxton and Joseph Jarman. So I, this is an album, uh, together alone, as you can see, that's come in and out of print and it's been out on, on numerous, uh, you know, records and CDs over the years. I think it's currently in print. Uh, the thing that I've had this for a number of years and listened to it when I first got it, liked it, put it up on the shelf and didn't listen to it again until just recently when I saw Joseph Jarman on TV. And when I put it on, I, I really did like it. Um, recording quality isn't, you know, it, it suffers from some of those problems, uh, of, you know, being from 1971, but, um, because there's no, uh, rhythm section band, there's no, uh, you know, drums or bass or anything like that. It's mostly saxophones, um, a bit of piano that's played by, um, Anthony Braxton. The thing, one of the things that made me, um, pick this up though, w w which kind of struck me as curious because I knew it was from 1971 is it, it, there's listed as, uh, having some synthesizer on here played by Joseph Jarman. Um, I wouldn't buy it expecting to hear synthesizer in the end. After hearing it, I really can't place any synthesizer, except there are some things that are, you know, that could fall under sound effects um, in in one or two of the pieces that I guess could be coming from a synthesizer. It's not electronic music by any means. Um, but it's really hard to place whether or not those otherworldly sounds are coming from a synthesizer because of the number of uh, horns that these guys are playing and the way that they play them. They get a lot of kind of kind of freaky sounds out of the horns as well. Um, and there's also flutes. Uh, both members play flute on here as well. Um, but it's it's interesting for the lack of percussion. There's no rhythm section. It's just these two, you know, giants really of of quote unquote free jazz on here. Um, I really like this album, um, and it's one that um, until until I bought the CD, until I saw the CD online um, and recorded in one day, which always amazes me. It's just it's 42 minutes. It's a typical album length piece. Um, but until I saw this listed the day that I bought it, literally, I had no idea this existed. Uh, but then again, there's a lot of solo works that the guys from Art Ensemble Chicago have done over the years that are on smaller labels. This is on De from Denmark. It's called Denmark Records, but it's out of Chicago, Illinois, this particular version uh, from 1994, which is probably close to when I bought it. Um but I really like it. You know, a couple free jazz freakouts that if the whole album were like that, I probably would, you know, play it a lot less. Um, but there's some very interesting uh, things that appear to be written out, uh, you know, duo horns. Um, really, there's some nice stuff on here. Um, makes me wish that they had done more together. But having seen Joseph Jarman on TV and then playing that uh, caused me to pull out, you know, I'm going to show you my vinyl only because I can't find most of the, the, the vinyl that I have, actually. Um, I'm, I know that I have uh, the things I'm about to show on CD on vinyl as well, but the only ones I could find were, um, this could have been the first, I'm not sure, I think one of the other ECMs were the first. Being an ECM fanatic, if you've watched my channel, you know I'm, I'm a big ECM fan. So naturally, um, not having previously discovered the Art Ensemble of Chicago um, earlier, and they started recording uh, around 1978 for ECM. Um, this is probably the first album I bought by them, Nice Guys. And uh, I've only got a handful of their albums. Sorry about the glare. I really can't do anything about the glare. Um, this was a 78 album. 
by the Art Ensemble of Chicago. Um, the Art Ensemble of Chicago goes way back. They actually started as Roscoe Mitchell's band, one of the saxophone players. Uh, he had a sextet in 1966, and in that sextet was Lester Bowie, the trumpeter, and Malachi Favors, the bass player. They were playing under uh, Roscoe Mitchell's name, and um, in 66, and then 67, saxophonist Joseph Jarman joined them, and that they, they still were playing under Roscoe Mitchell's name at that point in 67, and a guy named uh, Philip Wilson, a drummer, joined them, and uh, that's really when they kind of started their approach of, you know, playing a lot of instruments and a lot of bells and a lot of even, like, children's toys using them for sound. Uh, that's, that's really the late 60s when the whole kind of musical direction and concept of the Art Ensemble of Chicago uh, really came about. You know, the two saxophone players were playing flutes and, you know, small saxophones, you know, all kinds of saxophones, flugelhorns, conch shells, all kinds of things. Um, and they all, you know, numerous musicians in the band also play piano. Uh, that drummer uh, stayed with the group, that drummer Philip Wilson stayed with the group. They didn't use the name Art Ensemble of Chicago um, until later, though. Uh, Philip Wilson left two years later in 69 to join the, 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 the blues rock guy, Paul Butterfield's band, and the band continued uh, as a four-piece. Lester Bowie, Malachi Favors, uh, Roscoe Mitchell, and Joseph Jarman, just as a four-piece. And that's when, actually, a, a promoter, when they were playing somewhere overseas, actually build them as the Art Ensemble of Chicago um, to kind of identify their Chicago USA roots. And they liked the name of the band, so they kept it. So their first uh, early, early albums were actually recorded as that floor piece. And um, back around 1990, I think it was, uh, 1970 or 71, um, I think it was 70, when uh, Don Moyer, their, their drummer, became the fifth member, because they were playing without any drummer at all as a four-piece, um, 70. I think it was 70 Don Moyer joined as a drummer, and that was the, the classic lineup, and that's when they you know, really became the art ensemble of Chicago that everyone knows. They recorded many albums for many labels, um, mostly smaller labels, uh, you know, European labels, foreign labels. Um, and the only early one that I have that I could find, which is an album called Phase One, this I don't have on CD, um, and this was recorded February 1971, so the same year as that Joseph German album, actually. And uh, really the classic lineup, or the main lineup, was really those five guys that are in place here. Um, I like this album. I haven't played it on my turntable lately, um, but it suffers from the problem of that I mentioned earlier of the kind of free jazz thing not being very well recorded in the early 70s, late 60s. Um, so I kind of stayed away from the early stuff, and because I'm not going to collect everything that the Art Ensemble ever did, um, I decided to stick with their, their ECM output for the most part and maybe veer off into some solo stuff. Um, so here's a 78 album. This is when they started recording for ECM and ECM. You know, I don't know about their later recordings after they left ECM and stuff they did in the late 90s and, you know, early 2000s. Um, I'm sure they're better recorded. I don't have any of the things that they've recorded in recent years, uh, even without the two founding members that passed away. Um, but I figured, you know, if I'm going to jump deeper into their catalog... I'm probably going to stay with the, you know, the stuff that was made by the classic five-man lineup uh, before Lester Bowie passed away and before um, bassist Malachi Favors passed away. They've had fill-in musicians ever since, and that seems to be um, not stable. The, the additional musicians they're using in the in the band um, seem to change quite a bit. And considering there's a lot of albums by them I don't have, I might as well stick with the stuff, you know, uh, if I'm going to pick up things I don't have, I'm going to stick with stuff that was made by that classic five-man lineup. So Nice Guys I've had on vinyl. Uh, I haven't listened to it in years. 
But I got into this thing and I was spending money again that I shouldn't have. So what did I do? I bought the CD. So I have been listening to it. I just got the CD um, a couple days ago. Um, I also, you know, I'm sure I had this this one on vinyl. And I couldn't find it. Uh, Full Force, another ECM album they made. Um, when was this recorded? Uh, 1980, January 1980. This was. Um, all of their ECM stuff is extremely well recorded. If you know ECM, you would expect it to be. Um, and this is where you can really hear what the band is doing. Um, you know, when they get loud and there's a cacophony of sound going on, it's nice to be able to clearly hear what one saxophone player is doing, what another saxophone player is doing, what the upright bassist is doing or what the drummer is doing. And like I said, a lot of those early albums recorded in the late 60s and early 70s, you can't discern that. You can't get that information audio-wise out. Um, with DCM, you know, they know how to record albums, no doubt about it. And you can still hear all the quiet stuff. There's times when it gets so quiet that you think, what the, there's nothing going on there. And, you know, maybe you have to turn up the volume a little bit. That's especially true. And I remember when this album came out, I bought this as a new release. They're double live on ECM also, Art Ensemble of Chicago, Urban Bushman. Um, nice double disc. It's about 90, 92 minutes. 92 minutes of stuff, uh, live performances. I, um, not, it's not one concert, it's a, it's a concert tour, but the way they selected the pieces, uh, it plays like, you know, you were at a, you know, an hour and a half long concert. This is one with a lot of quiet stuff in there. Reading reviews of it, people say that this is much, much, much more low key than their earlier stuff, and it's because they're on ECM records. Honestly, I, I cannot see the Art Ensemble of Chicago guys uh, tailoring their sound for a record label. Uh, you know, to me, they always did what they did. Um, and I don't think they cared who was recording them in terms of changing their musical direction. So, yeah, you know, as we got into the late 70s and the early 80s and they made a lot of albums, uh, yeah, the wild free jazz freakouts were still there, but they weren't the entire spectrum of what they did anymore. Like, I guess some of the stuff that they did in the late 60s and early 70s was pretty wild all the time. Um, so, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, you should get their stuff from 1970 or 71 because Urban Bushman is, you know, is like too quiet and too low key. But I don't know if I could listen to, you know, an hour and a half straight. I probably could, but I don't know how often I'd want to listen to an hour and a half straight of just saxophone freakouts. I've done that in the past. I haven't done it for years. I was able to do that in the early 80s, maybe, but I kind of lost interest in that, in, you know, by the late 80s. Um, so this, I, you know, this is a, a pretty damn good place to start, I would say. It's very well recorded, even though it's a live album. And, you know, you're not inside one of the ECM recording studios. The sound is really good on this uh, because you've got a lot of material. You've got over an hour and a half of material. You get a pretty wide range of what they do. It's all, you know, it's an all acoustic ensemble with, you know, the two horn players who double on flutes and coronets and things like that. Um, upright bass, drums, they all play various kinds of percussion and Lester Bowie on trumpet. Um, they all play a little piano at times. A couple of their albums have a little touch of synthesizer on them. Um, but so this is one, I was dying to hear this again and my turntable doesn't, it semi works and I spent an hour and a half on the floor trying to change wiring around yesterday for my turntable. Um, but I, I, I really tend not to play vinyl much anymore. Uh, I do it only pretty much to copy the vinyl into a computer so I could burn it onto a CDR so I could listen to it again. So I restrict my vinyl playing mostly to things that never came out on CD. So even though I don't have a job and I don't have an income... I had to buy the, I had to, you know, shop around the cheapest price. I bought the CD edition of this, of the Urban Bushman album. And, you know, it's better having this on, on, on two discs, and, you know, obviously flipping over four sides. And the quiet stuff, you know, really pays off because there's no way vinyl could be that quiet. There's a lot of extremely quiet moments on this live album. It's a good album. Real good album. That would be, you know, maybe... 
may be the one that I would play, you know, uh, to introduce people to them. Um, maybe, uh, you know, I might also, you know, be tempted to, uh, you know, the, this, a comp, you know, here's the, uh, compilation of the Art Ensemble Chicago's ECM years. Um, this, you know, has selections from the, the handful, because they, they didn't record a lot of albums for ECM, but it has, you know, a selection from uh, Urban Bushman, uh, Full Force, Nice Guys, the albums I showed, um, and a uh, sample from Roscoe, uh, Roscoe Mitchell's solo album um, that Roscoe Mitchell recorded for ECM, and uh, also Lester Bowie recorded a bunch of albums for ECM. There's one selection on uh, on this from those as well, so it's not just Art Ensemble of Chicago. Um, so this is, a, I guess, a decent sampling of, of some of their ECM stuff. So this might be a good place to kind of jump into there, too. Uh, I would rather they have stuck with selecting the full band Art Ensemble of Chicago stuff um, instead of including the stuff from the solo discs, because even though they only recorded, like, I don't know, five or six albums for ECM, whatever it is, there's, you know, obviously enough to fill a CD and enough good stuff to fill a CD. But um, for a long time... Um, this was, I think, the only uh, actual CD I had by the Art Ensemble Chicago. So when I wanted to hear them again and I didn't want to pull out my vinyl, I bought I bought this a number of years ago, uh, before I got the Full Force album. So for a long time, all I had on CD was Full Force and that comp, and then I started going nuts, you know, picking up their other stuff. Um, another ECM album, this was called The Third Decade. You know, all five guys still still alive, still in the band from 80... Oof. I didn't prepare. 85, a number of years later. So Urban Bushman was 1980. This is 85. This is the only album that I got by them where there's some noticeable synthesizer playing on there. Um, and there's an actual funk tune on here. It's interesting to hear funk played with an upright bass because it's it's... You know, like, like funk, you would imagine the, the bass is the main voice. You know, there's a drum thing going on, but the bass playing this repetitive funk groove uh, is the main bass of that song. And uh, it's, it's, qu it's quite interesting um, to hear. It's probably my least favorite track on there. Uh, it's called Funky AECO, which I guess stands for Art Ensemble of Chicago. Um, a seven and a half minute funk track. Very unusual. Um, for them, but they've done reggae tracks as well. Uh, you know, there's like a reggae track with with vocals on one of the other ECM albums I showed. So they kind of jump into a lot of genres besides the, the jazz thing. Um, so this has uh, some really nice pieces on there, and for the first time you can really hear. They, they may have used synthesizer on a couple albums, but you know, mixed in with the horns and the flutes and the upright bass and all the stuff that's going on, the lots of sounds that they use from found percussion and stuff like that. Um, it's hard to really discern the synthesizer, except on this album. You can actually hear it uh, using it a couple times as a, almost like a lead voice. And it actually works. I, I really like this album. Again, a lot of people don't like this period because it's them not really doing so much of the free jazz thing, but man, I, I, I really like this album. Maybe not the best introduction to them because they're kind of getting outside of what they're known for. Um, on the interim, uh, founding member Lester Bowie, the trumpet player, uh, died of liver cancer in 1999. Um, and, um, in two, I believe it was 2004, Malachi Favors, the bass player, passed away as well. Um, however, before, uh, before 99, when uh, Lester Bowie passed away, Joseph Jarman, the saxophone player, left the band, as I mentioned earlier. To, I hope that music's not too loud. It's really loud here, but um, I don't know where the volume control is. I found it. As I was saying, Joseph Jarman left the band. Um, to, to open his, his Buddhist center or to work in the Buddhist center in New York. Um, I don't believe it was anything to do with uh, <coughs> any issues with the band members, but rather the desire not to, uh, probably not to travel and, 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 you know, play so much out uh, touring. 
So the band became a four-piece for a while um, when Joseph Jarman left. And uh, then Lester Bowie passed away, the trumpet player. And the band went into the studio a number of years later. I want to say uh, 2002, probably, possibly 2003, um, and actually recorded as a trio. Jarman was still out of the band. Bowie had passed away. And the remaining three members um, recorded an interesting album, Tribute to Lester, which is another one that I just picked up. Very, I say, not very different in terms of musical direction. And by the way, that's Lester Bowie's picture on the cover. Um, it's not uh, different in terms of direction. There's some free moments on there and some stuff, you know, that, that's very, very much in the direction of the music that they were doing in the 80s and 90s and going on into the 2000s. The difference is this is done as a trio. So instead of, you know, this five piece with a lot of sound going on, it's down to a three piece. And I'm not sure whether or not they use overdubbing. If there's overdubbing on this, it's subtle. Um, I want to say probably most of the band's albums, when they were full five-piece, probably had almost no overdubbing. Um, maybe a couple of the ECM piece uh, albums may have had some subtle overdubbing. But for the most part, I, I, I believe that most of their albums, at, at least going into the 80s, were... Uh, largely essentially live albums in the studio or live on stage, um, you know, with the five piece. A lot of stuff going on. Probably little, little need to overdub. And like I said, there might be some subtle overdubs in, in, in perhaps on a couple of the, the ECM albums. Um, this one may have some overdubbing on because it's only a three piece down to, um, Roscoe Mitchell on saxophones, flutes, whistles, percussion. Uh, Malachi Favors, uh, double bass, whistles, gongs, and drummer Don Moyer, um, you know, drums, percussions, chimes, gongs, and all that. Um, so this is very much in the, uh, you know, in the mode of what um, Art Ensemble Chicago was doing, um, you know, 80s, 90s, 2000s, but stripped down. So you can really hear, this is just a trio now. And... Um, you know, looking at this, now, I, I, I haven't been listening to it, but um, looking at it, I realize there's, there's not even any piano on this. So it's it's uh, a lot different that, you know, what you don't realize, the music itself isn't that different. But hearing it without a second saxophone player, without Lester Bowie's trumpet, um, you, you probably wouldn't guess that it's the, the Art Ensemble of Chicago. Uh, very interesting album, like I said, but more for people that are familiar with what they sound like. Closest thing I could compare it to was uh, probably early uh, 60s Ornette Coleman. Ornette Coleman had a trio, uh, you know, saxophone, and um, sometimes he would double on another instrument besides sax, uh, upright bass and drums. And when I was listening to this, it reminded me, oh, you know, this, I can almost mistake this for Ornette Coleman album. But very interesting. From the you know from the point of view is a lot of people would um, say that it's very different from their stuff, but it's I don't think it's different. It's the fact that that sex and second saxophone is not there, trumpet's not there, um, and um, I love it. So the only other thing that I found I may have more. Being a fan of the ECM in general, I have Lester Bowie's Works ECM compilation album. And this is good because Lester Bowie recorded a whole bunch of solo albums for ECM in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, a lot of them, I didn't pick them up individually. Um, he was doing something completely different there. Had a large ensemble, a brass ensemble in a lot of cases with a lot of horns, and was doing kind of odd, funny, uh, kind of avant-garde reimaginings of pop music of like the 50s and 60s, if you can imagine such a thing. So he would do something like, which they put on the comp here, a version of Let the Good Times Roll, which is probably from the 50s. Um, and as a matter of fact, one of his albums is even called Avant Pop that he recorded for ECM. So this is, I'm, I'm a collector anyway of the, the ECM uh, Works series, I'm a big fan of compilation of, of a certain compilation series, and when I'm a fan of that series, I try to collect everything from that series, even if I'm not particularly into an artist. Um, 
This introduced me to, I, I had, really hadn't picked up Lester Bowie's ECM solo albums. Now there's one that I want that I can't get. Uh, so if anybody knows where I can get a copy relatively inexpensively, because they're going for a small fortune, on compact disc, on CD, not on vinyl, of um, an album that he recorded, Jesus, I've been looking at it for, uh, I just blanked out on a name, called, uh, I just blanked out on the name of it, All the Magic. So he did this album, All the Magic, which is a two-disc set uh, in 1982. One album is his brass band in this All the Magic set, and there's some samples of it here, which is what turned me on to it. So one of the albums is his uh, brass ensemble. The second album is, and this is the thing that there's a bunch of excerpts on here from that I fell in love with, which is what makes me want to get the All the Magic album. And that is, um, it's all um, Bowie solo. Lester Bowie, completely solo, no other musicians. Most of the tracks are just solo trumpet. And there's about 10 or 12 minutes of excerpts of the album on here. And there's some interesting effects going on. At one point, there's a piece where he's playing the trumpet into a, uh, a piano, um, you know, a big open piano with the microphones jammed into the piano. And the vibration from the sound of the trumpet is making the metallic um, piano strings vibrate. And so it's making an interesting sound. So in addition to just solo saxophone, there's, it seems to be there's some tracks that have either processing on them or some kind of alternate way of recording, like using this inside of the piano. Um, and when I heard these pieces again, I've had this for a while and only pulled it out and listened to it again when I started getting it back into the art ensemble and, and, and Joseph Jarman again. And it's like, oh, I got to get that album. That's, I really want that second disc, that, that solo disc on the Ola Magic set. And of course, I looked it up and it's been out of print forever. Oddly enough, vinyl copies are cheaper than CD copies, which makes me think that it was probably, you know, that's usually not the case. Um, it's probably came out very shortly on CD and got discontinued very quickly is my guess. Um, but if anybody finds a copy of that on CD or knows where I can get one at a reasonable price, please let me know because um, after hearing the solo pieces on this, and this is this is in, you know this is interesting. Um, I wouldn't say it's a place to start. You know, certainly not Art Ensemble Chicago. If you're familiar with the Art Ensemble Chicago and you can get this. This is a good sampler of Lester Bowie's ECM years when he started doing this avant pop stuff. Um, but to me, the thing that really makes it, uh, there's also one track on here from the Art Ensemble Chicago. Uh, the thing that makes it is these, these solo trumpet tracks um, that are from this, this All the Magic album. Really fantastic, really interesting stuff. Really makes me want that, you know, to hear that whole album. Woo! Okay, so I did another marathon. I kept it under an hour and a half anyway. So that's what I've been listening to. Um, I'm going to treat you, forgive my mistakes and everything. Uh, I'm going to try to get back to doing this on a regular basis. I've been working on a lot of music. Um, not in some cases very successfully. I've spent 20, 30 hours working on a piece and then it didn't work and I had to start all over again. And I had a, a, a friend of mine that's got um, my album that took me an, about uh, 16 months to record. And he's, he's heard that and he likes it. But I had also sent him a uh, couple jam session things that I did, which were just live improvisations. And he said that he liked the jam session stuff better. And the, the, you know, and the jam session stuff was totally off the cuff with me and, and, and my buddy Glenn. And it was just something made up on the spot. And I thought, eh, you know, it's, it's good to like lay back and space out too, but there was nothing written, nothing prepared, very off the cuff. And I thought, you know, it was okay, not great, you know. And uh, I had sent him that and he said, oh, he likes this stuff better than the stuff that I spent 16 months writing. And I'm noticing that lately. It seems like the less effort I put into my music, the more people like it. So, you know, I've been working on things, you know, uh, for 20 hours that I end up junking, you know. 
um, and things. I'm working very hard on a lot of music. I'm not getting a lot out of it. And then, you know, I'm doing other stuff, which is taking, you know, musically speaking, I'm doing experiments, which are taking no time at all, and I'm putting them up because I don't plan on really publishing them, uh, putting them on the page, and people say, oh, I really like this, and I'm like, it took me, that was nothing, you know? Um, I've never toyed around with software before to alter music material, but, um, I, uh, you know, I have been. The last couple of things I put up are things that are called time stretching, which if you have a uh, basic software program, you can do. I've, I've always had the option to time stretch for 15, 20 years or however long the software has been around, but I never used it. I never experimented with it. And um, I had a friend, uh, Luke, Ambient Gaming, who creates very long pieces using time stretching. And I asked him to do a video to show me how he uh, made his music, because I was curious. And he did this really nice video. And um, so shout out to you, Luke, buddy. Um, and it made me go in, and I, I actually took things that I had recorded that weren't meant to be time-stretched, that were uh, pieces that I'm actually working on, that were meant to be played live in real time. And I would take a minute or two of them, um, and I would time stretch them, and I would get these pieces that are completely different than the input. I can hear the notes and the changes in there, but, um, you know, they're completely altered. In one case, I took one minute excerpt that I just happened to be recording of me holding down a couple chords on a computer, on a synthesizer. I recorded into a computer as literally one minute that got stretched to a 25 minute piece, thanks to time stretching. And I got to admit, I, you know, it's, it's not brilliant, but I really like the way it came out. And there's like no effort at all. And then I took another piece that was, uh, had two sections in it, a little bit of me playing electric guitar and a little bit of uh, synthesizer, about five minutes long, maybe. And again, it was something I'm recording, a regular piece to be played in real time. And I, and I took a chunk of this piece, about five minutes worth. And I time stretched it to 35 minutes, and I'll be damned if people aren't saying, you know, in some cases that they like it. I, I actually kind of like it. It doesn't sound brilliant. It's, it, it sounds a bit, um, it sounds a lot like something you would hear from the early 70s electronic music scene. It sounds like it's, it's made on some primitive electronic uh, equipment. I think like early experimental Klaus Schultz kind of stuff. Um, it sounds like it's from that era, oddly enough. And that's just the way it came out. That's not the way the synthesizers sounded um, when I was recording them in real time. But when you time stretch it, it kind of alters the, the tonal aspects. And, uh, you know, it does this weird kind of wobbly effect on it, um, kind of psychedelic. Um, but oddly enough, to me, it sounds like, uh, the last two pieces I put up sound like they were from the early 70s, and they're not. They're from this year. Okay. So, I, you know, I don't know. That's not a, a direction. I'll, I'll probably continue to do these experiments and post them up here if they come out decent. But I'm still working on doing my, you know, real-time, you know, hand-played music, uh, even though it's, it's really beating the crap out of me because I'm spending a lot of time doing it. I'm not getting a lot out of it. Um, but I am working on it, you know, with the eye toward releasing a real physical CD like I did over five, it's been five years, uh, April 2012, that I released my uh, CD, my album. And so I didn't, never intended on taking that long to do another one, but it's, you know, at least I'm working toward the next one. Okay, guys, this is over long. Sorry for the length. Hope everybody's doing okay. Thanks for um, watching, and thanks for um, commenting on my uh, my postings of albums that I've put up. My, you know, the albums that I put up that are out of print um, that people seem to like. Um, they're albums that I like, and since you really can't get them, or they're very hard to get, it's great that other people can hear them. So I appreciate you uh, listening to those as well. And I'll be back um, sooner than later. Take care, buddy. Take care. Have a great uh, rest of the weekend.